And now, from the CFTK TV studios, this is Open Connection with your host, Robert Picto. Welcome to Open Connection. I'm your host, Robert Picto. Dan's Legacy provides trauma informed and culturally sensitive counseling and life skills programs to youth at risk in Metro Vancouver. These young people, aged 15 to 25, are at significant risk of overdose, self harm, homelessness, and suicide. On today's Open Connection, Program Director Tom Littlewood. Tom is uh, an old guy um, who used to be a young guy. And uh, when I was young, I was uh, quite uh, active in street stuff and crime and doing the stuff that most street people have to do to survive, right? It's not that you want to do that stuff. You just don't have any other options. Uh, and especially back in the early 60s uh, when, uh, you know, uh, there was no such thing as group homes or there was, but if you had wealthy parents, you were just sent home, right? And that never used to last very long. So, uh, but I, uh, I I went through all that and uh, a lot of my friends uh, didn't uh, make it. Uh, they uh, overdosed, uh, addiction was rampant. We were all using whatever drugs we could get our hands on, but the main drugs were opiates and psychedelics, right? Because um, they're actually strangely a good combination for someone who's had lots of trauma. Um, I don't recommend that, but uh, it uh, seems to be the path a lot of kids take. So I went through that and when I got out of that, I, I, I wanted to do something about young people that were in that situation. So I worked at becoming a psychologist I was at first, my first stint was I was a police uh, counselor. I worked alongside the RCMP in uh, Prince George and sometimes all the way over to Terrace and whatever, depending on the situation. Uh, and uh, then I got transferred to Surrey and uh, I spent another three, four years there. And, and I realized that, you know, a lot of the young people that we reconnected, I would be, you know, catching them burning the park bench, you know, in the park on Friday night. And then they'd be in a, uh, my diversion program and I would see them change over that period of a year with a land based uh, programming where they do lots of outward bound kind of stuff and uh, and learning a basic work work ethic in the program. And I saw, wow, these kids, you know, they're not write offs at all. They can they can change if they're given an opportunity. And so I, I went from that into running uh, some uh, level three group homes and uh, and saw that, you know, more and more of these kids had no place to kind of go. Um, it wasn't a safe environment for them in the foster situation. It wasn't safe in their homes. And, and, and so, um, but there was something lacking that, you know, I, I could provide stuff in the home for them, but none of them really had a future because they were had been moved around so much. Most of these kids have had 15 to 20 placements in foster care, and that interferes with their education and interferes with everything. Uh, as well as helping with attachment disorders and all that stuff. So by the time uh, I was uh, qualified as a psychologist and developing programs on my own, I developed a program called the Sanctuary Foundation. And that's where we trained young people in bike mechanics, in ski hill technology, computer technology, marine technology. And a lot of the kids from the group home I was running were advantage, taking advantage of these programs. And others went on to university, and uh, um, it's it's amazing how how far these kids can go. Uh, Angela Starrett, uh, a very uh, important Indigenous CBC reporter, was one of the kids in my group home, and uh, and uh, not a waste of space at all. I mean, she was wonderful and thoughtful, and uh, you know, a, a total pain at times, but most kids are. And uh, she's turned into this incredibly powerful, beautiful woman with a young son that was almost her age when I was working with her. So it's, you know, you never know where these kids will end up. And so after about 20 years of Sanctuary Foundation, and I was able to actually take the bike mechanic program to Cuba, and I got to live and work in Cuba for five years, watching how a whole country can change, how they treat kids that are street active. Uh, and and uh, but most of the time, the way these people are treated, especially once they've 
gone from being, you know, cute kids at 15 to 25 and now a 30 year old street person um, that they're, they're treated like horribly. Right. And 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 there most of it is prejudice and biased and fear because there's a few of them that are really bad apples, but most of them are just lost people. And uh, and the time to intervene is not when they're hardened and on the street. The time to intervene is when they first ask for help in that 15 to 25 year old focus. And that's what we do with Dan's Legacy is provide therapy for those kids and training opportunities for those kids. And along the way, I picked up a couple of other, you know, community intervention strategies. And that's how we kind of met when I was speaking to a group in Terrace that was interested in working with getting some of the youth redirected and uh, some of the focus of the community away from seeing them as a liability, but as a potential opportunity. If the trauma is dealt with when they first ask for it, you know, it takes us about four months of a therapeutic intervention to make a difference costs about 2500 bucks to let it go on to an entrenched addiction that costs about a million dollars per client over a five-year period with hospitals and ambulances and police and you know corrections and all this other stuff open connection will be right back after these messages And now, from the CFTK TV studios, this is Open Connection with your host, Robert Picto. Thank you for staying with us. Dan's Legacy was founded in memory of a young man who, after surviving sexual abuse as a teenager, self-medicated with hard drugs in an attempt to numb the psychological pain of the traumatic experience. Let us return to the conversation as Littlewood shares more about Dan. Well, Dan's Legacy formed about 11 years ago. Um, uh, Dan was a young man who uh, went through some horrible sexual abuse, hit it like most young men do because he was ashamed that it happened from his family, started self-medicating and pretty soon he was addicted to hard drugs. Went through two very expensive but pretty well pointless 12-step abstinence programs which are not best practice and uh, especially after, for dealing with trauma and a, a bit, uh, uh, opiates with youth. But uh, he uh, relapsed and it cost him his life. His mother found him in his bed and uh, overdosed and dead in the morning. And they formed this, like a lot of families do this, form a foundation to try and help. You know, they want to not see this happen to any other kids. It's kind of a way to grieve in an intelligent way. But I think that it started wearing thin about five years along. And, uh, and uh, they were looking to me to help you know, re, re, regenerate it by raising funds for them. And I didn't see any future in that at all. But what I saw was uh, if we could develop an organization that would meet the needs. And we looked at what happened in Dan's life and what didn't happen. And he was so, it was such a common denominator for so many of the youth we worked with that we, we saw that first of all, we needed, kids needed access to therapy. 15 to, I say 15 to 25 year olds as kids, my kids are 40. So, you know, it's, uh, but that that's the time when their brain is still being formed and, and they start to the trauma and, or uh, any of the early onset uh, mental health issues like schizophrenia and other issues, bipolar, really set in, and and we knew that this was a sweet spot. That if they if we could if they could ask for help and we could be there without a four month waiting list or a six month waiting list, which is might as well just say no. Um, uh, with trauma informed and culturally sensitive therapists, um, and I ran around for three years piloting this with a recovery program on alternative school and a program that helps youth aging out of care with housing called Aunt Leah's. And uh, we're still working with Aunt Leah's, but we were able to show that we could double the success rate at graduation, at recovery and at maintaining housing by providing this therapy. Uh, this was gonna save the government millions of dollars which is the argument, even though it, it changes lives and makes people feel way better, you're not gonna get funding for that. <laughs> you know, you're gonna get funding for stuff that saves the government money. And that makes sense, I'm a taxpayer too, right? So, I mean, I'm not anti that, but it's like, it, it would be nice to have some other criteria to judge these kids by besides financial success, you know? Because sometimes when you see a kid, you know, three months before they're freaking out and having an attitude and three months later they're in a uniform 
them and they're graduating from our intro to cook program and ready to go to the world it's like you going wait a second look look back at my camera it's just you <laughs> you know you know different you know they just they they it changes a life when you're able to do that so that's what we're doing with Dan's Legacy, and uh, and we're just at the beginning. Uh, we're a young organization. We have some ambitious goals of of offering uh, commercial driving training, of uh, warehouse training, uh, getting back into bike mechanics again. Um, we have a team of ten therapists now. I mean. Uh, that was a dream I had. I never thought it would ever be possible. I thought when we got to five therapists, we were kind of, you know, actualized my dream. I can finally walk away. And then the government said, no, we're going to give you this huge amount of money. We want you to double your team because now there are lots of other organizations that provide therapy, but they provide one session or six sessions, which is for a trauma victim. You might as well not even start because you're probably going to trigger them and uh, it's going to be worse than when you started with six sessions. We need four months, sometimes a year or two for people that have really been in serious trauma or in uh, generational trauma, like what you'll get from residential school situation and then the scoop and then, the, you know, it's like a, it's not over yet. Colonization is like a train wreck. It's still happening, right? There's still boxcars flying all over the place, right? I mean, every time uh, they say something like, here's an award for kids that weren't treated fairly uh, with uh, welfare across the country, they then they hire 20 lawyers to fight it. Open Connection will be right back after these messages. And now, from the CFTK TV studios, this is Open Connection with your host, Robert Picto. Welcome back to Open Connection. Last year, British Columbia's Ministry of Mental Health and Addiction's $1.3 million grant allowed Dan's Legacy to double its counseling and outreach team to 10 therapists, two social workers, and two youth outreach workers. Let us return to the conversation with Executive Director Barbara Coates. We have doubled in size almost overnight. Five years ago when I started, we had a budget of about 23,000 and now um, it's at just over 2 million, which is amazing. Um, and But it's so necessary because the need is out there. As Tom will tell you, there's a thousand kids every year that age out of foster care that hit the streets more that you know run away from foster care before they actually age out at the age of 19 and all of these kids are dealing with trauma and as he said they'll end up on the street within a few years in entrenched addiction so um, the need is huge we made that case very clear and this is what's fueling the opioid overdose crisis which of course has been exacerbated by COVID-19 because um, the, a lot of the most of our clients are dealing with extreme anxiety and depression and when COVID-19 hit we saw a 50% increase in hospitalizations for our youth with uh, psychosis, overdose, suicide attempts. A lot of government agencies were following, um, you know, work from home mandates, so they weren't seeing their clients. So we took on an extra 50% uh, caseload. So we do have a much bigger team now. Thankfully, we've got a team of 10 therapists. We've got social workers, outreach workers. And yeah, that's um, as far as managing all that has been a, a challenge. But again, what we always do is we look for solutions. So we're looking at um, bringing in HR contractors and, and, and finance people and all the rest of it, because even though I multitask a lot and I'm pretty good at fundraising and communications, um, I have my limitations as well. But um, yeah, so we're bringing on more people at the, on the admin side of the team to help us manage this because what we don't want to do, we thrive on our flexibility and our uh, ability to meet the need as it's happening and not be um, hampered by, you know, uh, uh, difficult and, and, and restrictive bureaucratic processes. But we still need to run uh, an organization properly and effectively and answer to our funders, funders that are writing us checks for a million dollars. Right. So um, so we're finding that balance. Absolutely. Uh, we give them some skills so they can help build their self-esteem. Is that really been successful? Yeah, um, there, there's there's kind of three stages, right? To be there, so when they say, I want help. So there's we had two choices, build a tower so we could have all our therapists in this tower, but we saw that's already been done. That's what the health authority is doing, and these kids have no access to that, and not by the health authority's intent, 
but it's just that a kid that's, you know, living rough or couch surfing or, you know, uh, trying to survive on $760 a month and doesn't have a phone, how does he make an appointment? You know, he might not even know what day it is if you're living in that kind of a world, right, you know? And so, first of all, we, we need to be there so that there's a way for them to reach out to us. So what we've done is we've partnered, rather than build the tower, we've partnered with about 13 organizations, a couple of uh, indigenous communities, um, uh, a number of other nonprofits that are similar to us that provide housing or recovery or education and, uh, and with neighborhood houses and that kind of stuff. And our therapists work there. So we don't have to build a tower and spend $100 million to get established. Uh, and 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 we've disseminated the therapists over the whole community, so they're they're where the kids are, right? And uh, and and so that I use Aunt Leah's as an example because they're such a dynamic organization. They have uh, they they work for thirty years providing these services. They're a bunch of um, senior moms that kind of got together about thirty years ago and said it's not right that these kids lose all their privileges at nineteen and just get thrown to the streets. So they tried to provide Aunt, Aunt Leah's became like this cooperative and it become more and more. And the founder now works on their executive board and the daughter of the founder is now the executive director. So it's it's very much uh, an organization that's there like we are, not because we got a contract, but because we felt something. We were doing this before the government funded us. We're just able to do it better now that they funded us. If you wait until the government funds you, you know, uh, it's probably never going to happen or you'll get a contract that's so restrictive that it's irrelevant. So we, we we designed what we needed to do first and then we went to the government and showed, you know, you can't just do this, you've got to do this whole picture. So the second step is actually being there without a waiting list when these kids ask for help. That is a huge challenge when there's 20,000 possible clients out there and there was me running around, you know, for three years and then a couple more therapists and now we have a full team. Open Connection will be right back after these messages. And now from the CFTK TV studios, this is Open Connection with your host, Robert Picto. The world is a stage. My kid's room is a disaster. Life is a roller coaster. We all heard or used some of these metaphors. In this final segment of Open Connection, Tom Littlewood shares his metaphor as a lifeguard. The metaphor I use is I'm a new lifeguard. I just got hired on this thing and, and they have all the equipment that's really a cool job and we have schedules and we fly in with helicopter, pull people out of the waters, this whole production. And eventually I get a little burned out and I take a day off and I walk upstream. And I'm about a couple of miles upstream, never been up here before, and I see this bridge and there's this whole lineup of people right into the distance all lined up to jump off the bridge. So it'd be a lot more efficient to set a chair up there and say, don't jump, than this whole rescue operation that has to take place down below. That's what that's the philosophy that we're, we're, we're trying to be proactive. We're trying to look at harm prevention, not harm reduction. I mean, harm reduction is absolutely essential. Nobody should die from this right but nobody should be allowed to slide into that lifestyle if they've asked for help i mean if you didn't want help and that's what you want to do fine it's a free world do it but if you if, you know if your whole life was screwed up before you had a chance to even think about it and then the government goes cuts the, cuts the strings and you slide into oblivion into this where nobody can even see you because you have grade eight and you have, you, they expect you to get a job if you're gonna get your welfare check next month, but you don't have shoes, you know, or a bus pass or a phone or, you know, housing. I mean, how, how you know, they don't say, I'm okay, you know, I made it to 19. That's the highest at that age, right at 18 and a half to 19 and a half, there's a suicide spike that's really huge in those kids. They jump out of hotel windows. They, they throw themselves in situations that are almost sure death because they can't face what's coming. They have no idea what to do. So those are the three steps. First of all, you know, you've got to be there. You've got to make sure that you've got a way for them to get hold of you. And that's how we do it with our partnerships and through us outreach team talking to these kids on the street, having the organization that's not designed around its needs or the contract, but designed around the client's needs. And then uh, some kind of a way out for these kids 
so that they can, you know, actually fly away, right? And they do, right? And you see them 10 years later and you even recognize them. They put on 100 pounds, they've got two kids, a mortgage, and you think, you know, are they gonna attack me or thank me? <laughs> you know, kind of thing. When I was free and happy and on the street, you know, that's how we remember those six weeks. <laughs> Not the mortgage and the two kids and the dog that's sick, right? You know, so, you know, it's life takes these kids and carries them away in a beautiful, normal, kind of healthy way if we intervene and it's like a couple of grand to intervene when it's when they ask in the sweet spot we're talking about it takes millions to intervene later on when they're in entrenched addiction and uh entrenched homelessness so it's a pretty simple equation and when you look at it that way it makes sense but when i have to walk up to a funder and say you know uh give me some money now so something bad doesn't happen in the future i feel like i'm in the mafia but that's exactly what we have to do we have to be preventative and we have to understand the process and not be standing at hastings street and going how did this happen that's that's you know like an ostrich with its head in the ground we know how this happens we've explained it to the government the government knows how it happens uh, federally and provincially and, uh, and hopefully, now that they know what happens, we'll see some of these things start changing. So we move from a shame and guilt modality to one that's based on insight and empowerment. So that's kind of where we're at and what we like to say is our message. Our whole focus is on harm prevention, getting ahead of the problem before it happens. And this is what's key. Um, when uh, someone asks for help, be there for them when they ask for help and provide them with the basic needs uh, to stabilize, such as food and housing, then move into the trauma uh, counseling, and then help them with job skills training so that they have some kind of a future to look forward to. It's a full service wraparound support that we provide uh, from beginning to end. And, you know, it, it's, it's not, I hate to say it, it's not really rocket science. Everything that we do is evidence-based and and it's working and um if there are other communities that are interested in, in knowing more about how we work and what we do um we're happy to share that information it's not copywritten we can <laughs> we can parachute into any community and let them know but basically it's also looking at these young people seeing their potential helping them recognize it in themselves and valuing them as human beings. Uh, the opioid overdose crisis is not a, a drug crisis, it's a trauma crisis. And, uh, and as a society, we need to uh, stop blaming the victims all the time for the situation that they've ended up in. Treat them with kindness and compassion and offer it. We had one young woman speak at one of our fundraising events and she said something very profound. I'll end with this and that is um, the only time we should be looking down on someone is when you're giving them a hand back up. And I think that's really important. And that's what we're doing. We're giving these kids a hand back up. There's not going to be less of these people. There is no these people. There is no them and us. There's just us. And how we relate to each other shows us the kind of people we really are. Thank you for joining us for this episode of Open Connection. The greatest distance in the existence of man is not from here to there, but the connection from his mind to his heart. If we can conquer that distance, we can soar like an eagle and realize our immensity within. I'm Robert Pictow.